is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, the great book of St. John. You know, the Lord really loved St. John. He was the apostle that he loved. He chose him to deliver this book, this gospel, St. John. He chose him to do all three of the epistles of St. John and plus the book of Revelation. So what a vast amount of knowledge God revealed through him that um, is utilized by the world today by, in, with Christians to know and understand the word of God. We're gonna pick it up here in chapter two and, um, and it, we're going to do a wedding. Let's get right into it with a word of wisdom from our father. Chapter two, verse one, and it reads, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, let's, let's understand, three days later means it was three days later after verse 43 of the prior chapter, where he had picked up Nathaniel. He, he's picked up several extras. And evidently because Mary, because Mother Mary is a friend of this family, a point that she was invited, and then naturally Christ would be invited, there were several extras. This will probably cause them to run out of the wedding wine, that being one of the reasons. Cana, of course, means reeds. This was about eight miles due north of Nazareth, okay? So, therefore, the kinship or, or the the uh, familiarity with the family. Verse two, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And that, so we do, we've got extra people here. Verse three, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine, they, they run out. They're, um, verse four, and Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. This is a gross uh, mistranslation. It is done very politely. And it says, Madam, it is not my time for a wedding. So what has this to do with us that this family would run out? What he wants you to do is to know he is looking forward to that wedding, the wedding of his. This will be the first miracle that he performs. As he told Nathaniel in the closing verse of the chapter before, you haven't seen anything yet. And he would do this, which would ultimately be symbolic of his blood, would be the very wine itself. So he had said this in a very courteous way, but to let the deeper scholar know, he's saying, it's not time for my wedding. Well, it hasn't been yet, but it shall be. Verse five, his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. So uh, this again, uh, analyze that just a little bit. If Mary had authority to tell the servants what to do, they were pretty close. So this would be really a close family. She knew that Christ would handle it. Verse six, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three farkens apiece. Now, a farkon is nine, about nine U.S. gallons. So these are pretty good size. I do not think that he would have gone with, uh, with used them if it were two, because two times six would be, um, would, would uh, have uh, two times, rather nine times, uh, uh, nine gallons would have run it up to 18. 
But anyway, I'm pretty sure it would have been three farkins apiece. That would be three nines of 27 gallons a jar. Uh, we're, we're talking about quite a miracle here. Verse 7, Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. That's plain old H2O. And they filled them up to the brim, right to the top. Verse 8, And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. In other words, the governor of the feast is one that would have to approve the beverage that it was uh, met his satisfaction and that it was able to fulfill the needs of their moment. So having done that in verse 9, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, that's yayan, okay. and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, I mean, they had observed it. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and this is the one that is responsible for, for providing all these essentials. Verse 10, And he saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, the very best he's got. And when men have well drunk, then they, uh, that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. You kept the very best until now. Now, you're going to have some people that will tell you Christ would never make wine. And, and um, this, he was simply, it was grape juice. You see, that won't fly. Don't, don't ever mistranslate God's word. The very purification of the wine signifies Christ's blood. Because when, when you purify the vine, that's to say the grape, all of the sediments rise to the top and are skimmed away, and what is pure is pure, the process of fermentation purifies the substance. So, therefore, um, it was wine. But how, how does a student document that, the fact that it was not grape juice, but was the purest wine you could ever find anywhere? From the word translated in the English, drunk, in verse 10, the... the word is methos, and it means to drink to intoxication. Now, grape, fruit, grape juice will not intoxicate, but yayan, if you drink too much, would. It would intoxicate you. So certainly, um, uh, here, here we have the fact that, um, that it was done, his first miracle, and the first miracle was that he created or brought to front that that would be symbolic of his blood that would be at his wedding in de facto. De facto. So, um, and many people might say, well, I just can't buy that. I, God wouldn't have somebody drink wine. There's, uh, what, does it, what does it say in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23? Have you ever read it? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23 states, If you are nervous, if your stomach, if you, your stomach is upset, if you have infirmities, that means illness, take a little wine for the good of your stomach. Now, it didn't say a gallon. It didn't say a quart. It said a little wine for the good of your stomach. So it has medicinal purposes that are approved of the living word. And not only that, the purification process of fermentation um, is what symbolizes the pureness of Christ's blood. Now, we have uh, people that 
naturally that have infirmities that prevents them from partaking even of a little one. And that's fine. If you have that infirmity, don't worry about it. Don't leave, go around the wine, have nothing to do with it. And that's well and good. But don't try to change God's word to fit the regulations of some organization. Because the word is very clear. And you do not want to lose the beauty of that miracle of purification and how precious the blood of Christ. It doesn't get any better. And, and so it is that it's signified here. So, yes, we were at a wedding. Yes, it was not Christ's wedding. But Christ's wedding shall come. And... I, I believe this is why that with the wedding being picked at Cana, which means the place of the reeds, it, w it was to symbolize what would be future. His first miracle would be accompanied with his last, which is to say when he himself would be the bridegroom of that great wedding that is to come. So uh, it is real easy, you with Strong's Concordances, where the, the word drunk is, is used, where they have well drunk. Uh, check it out for yourself. It's real easy. And, uh, and you'll have the truth of the story. Verse 11, to continue. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. In other words, this very act brought forth the very glory of Christ <clears throat> that looked forward to that great wedding in that day in advance, but at the same time to, to um, assist and uh, the miracles naturally would cause belief, but the fact uh, the teaching thereof and the following, the message that is locked in is a beautiful message. Don't ever let anyone corrupt that for you. It is the fact of nature. Nature itself operates in this way. And if you do not follow the natural order of nature, you'll never understand the teachings of Christ. You have to go with the natural and the events that he describes and utilizes to pick up on the message he would have you receive. Verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum. And he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Capernaum is the city of Nahum, and it means the city of consolation. And they're not going to spend all that much time there. And verse 13, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, it would only be three Passovers hence that Christ himself would become the Passover lamb. And so this, this is a checkpoint. Something being, attention being drawn to it. Now, um, it is important also that we note in as much as he was that Passover lamb, that it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, Christ became our Passover. That's the high feast day. That is the high holy day of Christianity. It's the day that Christ paid the price that your sins can be washed away, that your sins on repentance can be forgiven, that you can have a new start in life. People that are mixed up, tore up, and <clears throat> disadvantaged, that in him you have that new start. Why? He is our Passover. Again, I will repeat 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. <clears throat> Verse 14, to continue. And um, 
And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. <clears throat> I mean, this is the house of God. If, if you're going to give God something, you're supposed to take the best out of your flock or your, your uh, harvest, whatever the case may be, from your own personal belongings and share that with the house of God. But here, we've got some people that have set up a quick trip. You know, a little shopping center here. You come in with us, and we're money changers. You don't want to give all that money to the Lord, so you give him this percentage, and we'll take this percentage, and then you take the rest home with you. I mean, I mean they're bankers right in the house of God. And, and these little old doves are probably mite infested, gathered in, to, not fit to, to offer as an offering on the altar of the living God. Well, what will Christ do about this? Let's find out. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 15. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, that's a cat of nine tails. That's a whip. He drove them all out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. I mean, you could hear that stuff ring down on those marble decks for miles to go there. But he cleaned house. He would not tolerate it. Well, oh dear Lord, you mean Jesus would do something like that? Well, it's written. Do you believe God's word or do you not? Naturally, he did it. That's his purpose was to clean. He's the head, of, he's the bridegroom, the head accountant. He's who's responsible. And when he sees someone mislead the children, he cleans house. And that's as it should be. They, they deserve to have it all torn up. They deserve to be thrown out. Now, you got to remember, though, we're going to have a little bit of a problem here. Because the synagogue or the church itself gets a little cut off of all this. They were pretty happy with the way this went on, that they not only had the offering, but they'd get a little cut off of... Uh, the rip off of the people. That's not a very godly thing, is it? Well, you'll hear about it before it's over because they're going to ask Christ, by what authority do you do this? And naturally, he being the son of God, he has the authority to do whatever is fitting and righteous. And this was a very, very righteous act that he performed here in cleaning God's house the right way. Well, how did he clean it the right way? He threw them out, period. Better off without them. Get rid of it. Verse 16. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And, and so it is. 17, and his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And, and what, what they're remembering is uh, Psalm 69, verse 9. You might make a home study of it. I'll say it again. Psalms 69, begin reading with verse 9. Uh, the, God's house is a house of prayer. God's house is not a house where people come to to get ripped off. God's house is a house where God's word is taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse, whereby people have an opportunity to learn the truth, not what man might say, but what the living God says. It is a hard thing for some to deal with, to picture Christ to platting together a cat of nine tails, 
You know, that's, that, that kind of, that can sting. And I mean he plowed into them. They didn't have to wonder, are we welcome here? They knew they were very unwelcome. And so, therefore, no, there are, if you have a church that does not have discipline, you don't have a church at all. Every house of God must be disciplined according to God's discipline, not necessarily that of man. Man has a way of, of uh, taking shortcuts sometimes, and he shouldn't, and, and so it is. Uh, but anyway, they, they knew the scriptures. God knew long ago that it would happen. He put it in the book to be on guard against it. Verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Document to us that you have the authority to come into this house, throw out, I mean, the money changers, you scattered everything, you got rid of all the offerings, the filth. By what authority? Show us a sign for that. And there they had standing before them the Son of God. If, if they had only known that they needed no other miracle other than his presence, the miracle he had just completed at that great wedding in Cana. But here they disbelieve, and he got into their pockets a little bit. And that doesn't work out real well, does it? Um, they wanted to know by what authority. And um, verse 19, what does he answer? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, um, this would be... They will remember this, and you might well remember it, because at Christ's trial, this will be used against him. And, I mean, it took 40-something years to build this temple. And he said, I, I can do it in three days. But what is he truly talking about? The student knows. It's his resurrection. Put him in the tomb, and in three days, he will resurrect, and will establish the true temple, which is the many-membered body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many people wonder, well, when is the temple going to be built? It's being built every day, every time that the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ goes out. New people become members of that temple. You see, it's not a temple made with hands. It's a temple made by the very presence and the spirit of the living God. But this will be used against him in his trial falsely, and because they would never ever understand. And, and so it is that he could do this in three days, because why? There's only one sign, the sign of Jonah in the whale's belly three days and out, that this would come to pass. Verse 20, then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? Question. How could you possibly do that? They have, they have no conception whatsoever of who they're dealing with here. Verse 21, and he spake, uh, but he spake of the temple of his body and, and that was the temple of his body. Where in another place, as I've stated earlier, he would say, the only, they're going to say, we want a sign. He said, the only sign you're going to have is the sign of Jonah. And Jonah's being that sign to save Nineveh, the very enemies of Israel. Um, Jonah tried to prevent that. A lot of people think he was a coward. He wasn't a coward, he was a hero. He was trying to save his own people. But anyway, God prepared the whale, the fish, and he was in that fish belly for three days and three nights and was regurgitated out in the side of some citizens of Nineveh. They just happened to worship a fish god. 
And when this fish brought forth this man, they received their Messiah. That's why Jonah could walk through and people would believe him and he converted the whole city of Nineveh, basically. But what Christ is saying here is that's the sign. Three days and three nights, I'll be in the tomb. But then I'm going to come forth. And you haven't seen anything to what Christianity will do to this world. It will start out maybe with 120. And it will spread and it will grow. And the truth will abound. And people will hear. And you will see a temple of, in a many-membered body that you could never imagine. You cannot defeat God's children. God's children always win when you obey God, when you stay with him. You're always going to be blessed, and you, you will always be with him. Verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Christ's life proves itself out if you just observe and watch and listen to him, to his teachings. You will always understand his way. Verse 23, And when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Naturally, miracles are a beautiful thing. It is the power of the finger of God that goes forth. Um, do miracles still happen? Yes, they do. In a way, many people don't even see nor understand. And certainly, um, uh, his name it's what is important. They believed in his name. Well, what is that name? Jesus. What is Jesus? Yeshua. What is Yeshua? It's Yahweh's Savior. In other words, they believed he was the Savior of the world. And when you find salvation, never let anyone shake that salvation from you by um, by presenting to you a Christ other than Yeshua. Because the false Christ shall come first. It is written by John in the Revelation. It is written in many places in the Gospels that the Antichrist would return before the true Christ did. So he's going to claim to be a savior. That's why he's called instead of Christ. Why? Because he tries to take Christ's place. You don't want to let that happen when you have the true Passover, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ and the miracles that he performs when he touches you and those around you. Verse 24, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. In other words, he, he knew human nature. He knew what human nature would do. And even today, when you teach God's word, you must understand human nature uh, and how humans will do. Verse 25, to complete the chapter. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He, he knew humanity, and he knew not to entrust um, uh, his messiahship at this time to this humanity, this mass of humanity. Again, what, what is it? Natural humans. Natural humans that listen to the natural teaching of God's word can absorb it, can let it settle in, and it will make, it will cause you to grow in that natural sense. But at the same time, what is Christ warning you and saying, no natural humanity? Because they will, they will take your lunch if you're not ahead of them. They, will, they will, can make things pretty rough on you. 
So you have to look at the steer of our faith, that is to say, God himself, and <clears throat> know that he always takes care of his own. And as he guides and leads the many-membered body that goes all the way around the world, and thank our Heavenly Father, we have a platform that goes all the way around the world, that that many-membered body can touch spiritually in the very truth of God. But at the same time, be aware of human nature in this world of troubled times. Because humanity will do as humanity chooses. Some humanity chooses not to be good. But they cannot infringe on your freedom to be a Christian, a follower of the true Passover, which is to save the Lord Jesus Christ and to receive his blessings when many that follow humanity and its bad ways will receive cursings. You don't need to go there. You need the blessings. It is God's promise that when you understand the nature of things, the nature of the beast, I could even say, the nature of humanity, don't, don't underestimate it. Don't try to put it off as something it isn't. Why? It's reality. And you live in a real world. But Christ will always see you through if you will have the faith to stay in his knowledge. That is to say, his word. For what did you learn in the first chapter of this great book? That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then what did you learn in the later verse? That the Word became flesh and walked among men, meaning Christ was God in this dimension that we could see him, that we could hear that Word. So listen to his Word, and you will always have the victory. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Um, please uh, never ask a question about a denomination, a reverend. We're not going to judge people. Do you know why? We have a judge, it's our father. He doesn't appreciate anyone else judging. But let your question be as things you might be concerned with and let God's blessings flow. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request? <clears throat> you don't need that number. You don't need an address. He knows what you're thinking even. You don't even have to say it out loud. He's got time for you. He created your soul, and he created your DNA, and it's different than any other human being because he wanted somebody unique. But he wants you to love him, and if you want his blessings, you'll remember that. Father, around the globe, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. 
Amen. Okay, question time. <clears throat> We've got, um, this would be Kinsher. I am Kinsher from South Carolina. I'm 12 years old, and I study with you a good bit. Could you please explain to me the Battle of Armageddon and uh, how Satan returns? Well, he, he will return, and uh, Armageddon, <clears throat> let's translate it, excuse me. R means city or hill, and Megiddon means Megiddo, the gathering place of the crowd. It means God's enemies. <clears throat> and it is God that will take care of that fight. Uh, just as he will overcome at the Battle of Haman Gog, which is a separate battle to the north. Sue from Tennessee. Where in the Bible can I find that it states there is no rapture? Well, where can you find in the Bible that the word rapture is even used? That, that would be the easiest thing, would be for you to prove that the Bible even speaks of a rapture, because it doesn't. But people have spoken it and spoken it until people hear it. <clears throat> and probably many people right now are saying, well, I can show him. I'll go to my Bible. You're not going to find it. You may find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he said, if, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen, if you believe Christ resurrected from the dead, then you better believe that all those that are dead in him or sleep in him have risen already. They're gone. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. They are with the Father. And then at the last trump, we who are alive and remain cannot precede the dead. Why? Because they're already gone. This is just that simple. But um, the false Christ coming first claiming to be Christ and he probably is going to teach the rapture doctrine, which is not biblical. Many people might jump on his wagon because they haven't studied God's word. Larry from Virginia. Where does it state that all souls return to the Father who gave it? I searched the Bible, but I cannot find it unless I missed it somewhere. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. It says, ere the silver cord part, that means you kick the bucket, okay? That instantly, or right away when that cord parts, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your soul and spirit body, returns to the Father that gave it, okay? Uh, Deborah from Arkansas, can I find Shepherd's Chapel on Facebook or other social networks or on YouTube? Sometimes it looks like you might be on these sites, but how can I be sure? You can be rest assured we are on none of them. Our copyright is being infringed by these people on here, and we, were, we are preparing suits to follow up on this. So if you happen to be one that is using copyrighted material, plagiarizing, plagiarizing it, I would advise you to close it down before you hear from us the other way. Um, I know some people might think they're doing a lot of good. You're not. You're hurting the ministry. So you have no right to co take copyrighted material and reproduce it. So we're, we are going to close them down. Um, it is, we have tolerated it and tolerated it. So. You will never see Arnold Murray or Dennis Murray in, uh, legitimately on any of those YouTubes, Facebook, junk, okay? We won't be there. We have our own network on television as well as, and we, we do have a website. One, that's all. And anyone that claims to be, I, I've even noticed that some people claim to be myself on those places. Well, I haven't been there, and they're liars. So anyway, we're, we're ready to start the, the suing process, and we'll see how it comes about. When you think you've seen us, you have not seen us, but we're not there, and you're looking at a bunch of uh, people plagiarizing. They have no right to do it. 
Eugene from Pennsylvania, keep up the good word. We're going to. I watch you and listen on. Thank you. The Lord's Prayer, and lead me not into temptation. This can't mean asking the Lord not to lead us into temptation. How does that line fit in, your, in the prayer? It means, uh, uh, um, do not um, try me past what I can handle, okay? So it, it, rather than temptation, translate it trial. You always say, God bless, uh, or bless God, rather, and he will bless you. How do you, as mere mortals with no powers, bless God? Well, what does he want from you? You bless him by giving, giving him what he wants. Have you ever read Hosea 6.6? 6? Do you know what it says? It says, I do not want your burnt offerings. I want your grace. That's your love. I want you to love him. That's what, that's what sacrifices will be in the millennium and eternity, is your love for him. That blesses him, and, um, and, and he loves it. Uh, Daniel from New Hampshire. My name is Daniel. I have loved our Lord and Savior for as long as I can remember, although I haven't always acted like it. Uh, most of my life I find it hard to believe things I was taught just didn't make sense to me and it caused a conflict in my soul. One day I cried out for help. The next morning I found Shepherd's Chapel. I've been studying with you for a few months now, and I know I was right to question a lot of what I was taught. I am 62 years old, and my soul has become calm, and I feel I can fight the good fight. Thank you for your teaching. I do have a couple of questions. If there is no gender in heaven, how could the fallen angel seduce woman? What, what was Adam made in the, in the image of? God and the angels. So, uh, uh, not Eve, but Adam. They were male, okay? Why do we only use 10% of our brain power? In, fl in flesh bodies, you have all kinds of hang-ups that that's all God allows. But um, thank, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Irene from... Arizona, uh, were there, was there a snake in the garden? Uh, thank you for your teaching. I now understand that Satan was the tree. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what the snake did. Well, un understand the serpent, is, it means in the Hebrew tongue, the glistening one. It's one of Satan's names. Uh, I want you to know there in Snowflake that you you, which um, I, I'm familiar with you by mail, uh, that is uh, communication, and uh, know and understand in, I, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, you find out that the serpent is one of Satan's names. It is Satan. Or you can go on to Revelation chapter 20 in the first three verses. And you see that the serpent is one of Satan's names, all right? So he was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he was that serpent, the glistening one. Okay, this would be, um, looking for a name, Pastor Maria Watt Shepherd's Chapel. This is Tracy from Washington. I have a question about Ephesians 6.13, where it states you may be able to withstand in the evil day, does the evil day happen to us all at the same time, or do each of us face this day at separate times? Do I just not understand? The, oh, you're okay. Naturally, the Antichrist comes to earth, and you must stand against the wiles of Satan in that same sixth chapter of uh, Ephesians. Uh, what, what is it? It's talking about put on all the gospel armor, every piece of it. And then you don't have to worry about standing against Satan. He'll run from you. He'll be afraid of you. Uh, Aglis from Texas. Uh, thank you so much for all you do. You're welcome to, to help us understand the Word of God. I would appreciate it if you would answer <clears throat> the following question and, and send me a print of, uh, okay, we can do that. In the book of, in the book of Acts, it reads that Ananias, chapter 22, 12 through 13, 
with the Holy Spirit was a Christian and helped uh, Saul cover uh, his right, recover his eyesight. Then in chapter 23, 2, Ananias uh, orders Paul to be slapped on the mouth. There were about five or six Ananiases in God's Word. This is, so it's two different people, okay? Ananias was also way back in chapter 9 and 10 where Paul's conversion took place. But the Ananias that was the chief priest at that time was a scoundrel. Okay. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons that I like to recommend the Smith's Bible Dictionary from our library. Because when you look up Ananias, it will give you all six of them, or however many there are, and what they did. It would help you with a lot of confusion. And hopefully, Bill from, uh, from Buffalo. I still cannot find the difference in my strong concordance for the Hebrew spelling of man of the six-day creation and the man referring to Adam in chapter 2. Because it's three different words. Eth ha-adam. You're just reading the word adam. Eth ha-adam is a separate man. And that's the way you tell. You, you know, basically, you're going to need a set of manuscripts. Anyone that really wants to investigate that, you need to order my teaching on the six, first six chapters of Genesis. And I show you the Hebrew on the screen and the DVD and teach you how to read it, if it's that important to you. Alice from Virginia. How can I prove to my family that Christ was not in the grave 3,000 years if a day is as a 1,000 years? We do so appreciate your teaching ministry and listen every night. It's on. Well, thank you. Well, you know, we, we covered it today, really, your answer. <coughs> the answer is <coughs> the only sign you're going to have is the sign of Jonas. Jonas definitely was not in the whale's belly for 3,000 years. And wh what is confusing the family is they're reading 2 Peter chapter 3 verses, what is it, 7 and 8, that states, be not ignorant of this fact that one day, one, one, year, one, year with, um, one day with God is as 1,000 years. But he was only in the tomb three days. <clears throat> you can measure it. He went into the tomb ha after being crucified on a Wednesday. Thursday at, a Wednesday at sundown begins Thursday on the Hebrew calendar. And Thursday was the first day, and then Thursday at sundown began Friday, which was the second day, all the way till sundown on Friday, then would become Saturday, and sometime in the night on Saturday he resurrected. Carol from North Carolina, Pastor, what is the difference between Judah and Israel? Well, they're two separate houses. The house of Judah is the king line, yeah. and that's what Judah was supposed to be. And, of course, the, the um, Ephraim, that, basically the ten tribes were called the house of Ephraim, uh, or and um, the seed of, of Jacob, but that makes up the house of Israel. They are separate now. But as you will read in Ezekiel chapter 37, in the prophecies concerning the joining of the end times, <clears throat> they're going to come back together and be one house. Pam from Pennsylvania, Pastor, where can I find scripture explaining the mark of the beast? Can you please explain it to me? I am very confused on this. Well, we offer a free Mark of the Beast tape. I think you should recommend, or would recommend you order it, request it. <clears throat> the Mark of the Beast is where it's in your forehead. What does it mean? Well, what's in your forehead, your brain is. It means the confusion can absolutely instill the bed ground for the mark of the false messiah to come into your mind not knowing the difference this is why jesus would say in um, 
Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. Satan, you can go down to earth and you can sting everybody down there except those that have the seal of God in their forehead. What's in your forehead? The seal of God. What's the seal of God? The truth. The word of God. If you have the word of God in your forehead, you're not going to be taken a fool by Satan. He's going to run from you. Anita from Missouri. Pastor Murray, you say that once saved, always saved is not the fact. Why do you not use Ezekiel 33, 16, and 19 to back up your statement? Could you please fill me in? Well, that, that, would, be, that would be a help, but it's common sense also. A lot of people that think they are saved never read the Bible because of false teaching or bad teaching, maybe I should say. I'm not going to judge anybody. But if you're not taught the difference between the true Messiah and the fake, especially if you're living in this generation of the fig tree, you're in a heap of hurt because you can claim to be saved, but if you worship the Antichrist, you're not going to be an overcomer. And many that worship him have sit in church all their life. And when, when the false Messiah comes, he comes in prosperously and peacefully, paying off all debts, Big Daddy and everybody that'll let him. I mean, a lot of people are going to jump on his wagon thinking it is Christ. But, you know, a child can count from one to seven. And you are warned over and over in God's word that the false Christ comes at the sixth trump. The true Christ doesn't return until the seventh. So there's no need to be confused about it. It's real simple. Our Father takes care of of his own by placing the seal in your forehead. You gain it there by studying the word of God. Blake from South Carolina. Is Jesus Christ here with us now or will he be coming in the spirit from the clouds in the sky or will he be reincarnated? Well, he, there's no such thing as reincarnated, okay? Um, incarnate but not re. Uh, Christ is very much, he's at the right hand of God. Spiritually, his spirit is with us. It's the Holy Spirit. And, uh, but he will de facto, or I should say de jure, to be correct, he will return. But it will not be until the seventh trump. Now, the old serpent, the devil, Lucifer, is going to be cast out of heaven by Michael in Revelation 12, 6, and 7 to play Jesus down here on earth for those that are unlearned. What a mix-up that's going to be. So, um, <clears throat> so that's how the true Christ comes, but you want to be aware of what happens first, the false Christ comes. Tiffany from Georgia. Can you explain Matthew 24, verses 2 and 3? Thank you. Well, Christ is being asked a question there in Matthew 24, 2 and 3. He's leaving Jerusalem, and they're saying, look at these buildings. Whoa, they're huge. They're monstrous. And then he tells them in 3 what, what the sign will be of his coming and what the sign will be for the end of this world. And then he continues on in the following verses in Matthew 24 and gives you all seven seals, all seven trumps, and all seven vials. It's all taught in pure language that anyone can understand. The coming of the false one, what will happen <clears throat> when, when you are delivered up to witness and so forth. It's what happens at the end of the world. We're getting there. Angela from Virginia. I understand you to say we should not eat a scavenger. What is a scavenger and what food should we eat? Well, a scavenger is an animal, a creature that God has created to, to consume filth from off the earth, rotten flesh and disease. And... Um, uh, bottom feeders in fish that eat the dead bodies and things uh, that 
from the bottom, the feeder, rather than live bait. <clears throat> so you can find out in Leviticus chapter 11 what you're supposed to eat and what you shouldn't eat. I use scavenger to simply simplify it. Many people from 1 Timothy chapter 4 are confused. They think Christ made it okay. Well, because they can't read any longer, I guess. Because it says very clearly, don't let someone judge you in marriage. And don't let somebody judge you in what you eat if you're partaking of that that God created to be received. God did not create scavengers to be received for food. Okay, uh, Beatrice from Wisconsin. How do we all become different nationally from Adam and Eve? Well, God created all the races on the sixth day. And on the eighth day, he created Ethan. Um, and there, but from one to the other, whether it's hunters, fishers, or, or husbandmen, as Adam and Eve truly were, then um, you are, they're all God's children. And I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes his day when you read the letter he has sent to you informing you so you're not deceived to bring clarity into your life whereby you find that assuredness, that great hope of loving him and make his day, he will bless you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we have helped you, only if we've helped you. You help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. You can count on it. Now, most important, you stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. Know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. book of Peter. Here we have two books, First and Second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman, which in his gentleness and his kindness brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them.
Arkansas, this is with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Okay, good day to you. God bless you. We've been waiting on you to get right into the Word. We're just going to kind of visit along a little bit. We're going to talk about your destiny, a subject that interests everyone, for you cannot help but wonder, what does the Bible mean to me? What, do, what is my place in it? Probably better said. We're going to address that a little bit. As Christians, some of the finer points, perhaps, yet very basic to most of you, but it's good every once in a while just to go over, and we're going to do that. We just thank our Father for this great nation, America, and 